a rite of passage of speaking networking is to understand this OSI model. Now, the OSI model is just a reference model, and that's this diagram, and let's consider that fully covered. It's a reference model. But there's four other ways to look at it, and we actually need to understand all of them. So next, we'll talk about logical versus physical. As it turns out, layers seven all the way down to halfway through layer two are pure software. They're all logic. The bottom half of layer two to layer one, physical. Now there's addresses that are applied. Certain addresses live on certain layers and they have a meaning and a purpose for them and we need to understand what they are. Now there's only four, so you can do this. Then we'll take a look at this OSI as actually an organizational chart, right? Usually layer eight, which of course it doesn't exist, but uh, it's usually the butt of some jokes, like it's the budget or it's the administration or management, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but there are actually careers that exist within certain levels on this chart. We should understand that. And lastly, and most technically, let's understand how we would actually get a packet from layer seven all the way down there to layer one, and then back up again through the layers, delivering information to the other side. Now, the OSI model, as I've said earlier, all seven layers, actually break down into seven through halfway through layer two is pure software. There's no hardware involved at all. But halfway through layer two, uh, an organization, for instance, called the IEEE gets involved, the electronics engineers and those guys, which are concerned with turning software into hardware. That occurs halfway through, we hit the physical layer or the phi layer, for instance, of ethernet, and ultimately layer one, which certainly is physical. That would be the wiring, the ethernet cabling itself, uh, fiber optic cables, that sort of thing. There may be seven layers in the OSI stack, but there's four addresses that I think we should really understand. Uh, no address at the hardware layer that we're concerned about, but the MAC address, exists at layer two. Now this is a very local address. This would be relevant to the local area network that you are connected to, or that Wi-Fi that you're connected to. Uh, but it really doesn't have a global significance per se. That's where the IP address comes in. Now an IP address will always locally associate with a MAC address. But when we are communicating across the internet, we never communicate to that remote guy's MAC address. That never happens. Across the internet, we connect from an IP address to another IP address. That gets us to the correct server or to the correct device. But once we get to that correct device, how do we get the information to the correct application? That's where the port address comes in. So at layer four, the port address, whether it's SCTP, TCP, or UDP, the port address gets us to the correct application. Finally, the application identity itself, the one that probably we all are most familiar with, would be a URL such as HTTPS or mail to, and, and the list goes on and on. Ultimately, what application layers must do is take that name and map it to an IP address and port address. And that particular mapping or that binding is so important that the IP address and port address, when combined together, always connected with a colon, has a special name. That's referred to as a socket. And we can think of as a socket as a manifestation, the logical manifestation uh, of whatever that HTTP message or that HTTP address that we have may, may have specified up there. Another way to look at the OSI model is actually to look at it as an org chart. The reason for this is the model's pretty complex and knowing the entire stack is difficult for most people. Just knowing one layer can be kind of tricky. Application developers, people who actually write code, primarily are living at that seven, six, and five layer. They will reach down into the socket, into the transport and network layer but that's a solid overlap with the network engineers. So our network engineers, right here, that green, they are actually concerned from the physical layer all the way up through to the transport, to the port address. So there is an overlap, and there needs to be, between networking 
and between application developers. Now, facilities people, uh, again, a different branch, a different skill set, are actually concerned with the physical facilities themselves. These are the people that are handling the actual transport of the bits. Interestingly, the bits per second actually doesn't even apply until you get all the way down here to layer one. That's the layer that ultimately manifests in bits per second. In this example, we are going to take information from the application and it'll pass down to layer seven, which will add overhead and pass it down to six, which adds overhead to layer seven. And this continues until we get all the way to the bottom. Now I'd like to introduce a thing called a service data unit and a protocol data unit. This is a measuring cup. It's a one quarter cup measuring cup. And let's say this came from the application. If I'd be layer seven and I received this, this would be my service data unit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add overhead to that. So let's, let's grab a one third cup and like Russian dolls, we'll stack them. This would be a layer seven protocol data unit and we pass it down to layer six. Layer six accepts it as a service data unit, adds its overhead, slap another cup on there. Now this is a layer six protocol data unit and we pass it down to layer five. It's a service data unit to layer five until layer five adds its overhead. Now this is a layer five protocol data unit. And we pass it down as a service data unit to layer four and layer three and so on and so forth until we get all the way to the bottom. Um, it would appear is that the data that we're actually sending is this, but what it looks like when it actually gets on the wire looks like that. Um, it's actually not that bad, uh, but you get the idea. That's how it works. Now, each one of these layers has a certain specific thing to do. So let's take a look at that, see what each one does in particular. We start out with a file. In this particular example, I'm going to use a TCP session to actually move that file from Mr. Host A to Mr. Host B. So the file is passed down to layer seven as an intact file where that of course is a service data unit to layer seven. Layer seven overhead is added. That's information that'll make sense when it arrives over at layer seven. But meanwhile, we pass it down to layer six. It is a service data unit passed down to layer six, but layer six adds its overhead and we are at the presentation layer. Now at the presentation layer, we are concerned with, for instance, how the, if it's voice, how it would be encoded or how it would be encrypted. If it's media of any sort, how it, what codec would apply. If it's information that would appear on a screen, is it bold, is it blinking, is it bright, is it dim, is it strong, all that sort of thing. How the information should be presented at the other side so that it would look as intended from the sending perspective. That information passed down to layer five. And at layer five, of course, layer five adds its overhead. Now this is, an very, this is a very important layer, mostly from the perspective of it's actually not implemented very well in the public internet today. This is regrettable. If the session layer were perfect, then any information that arrives to the session layer is guaranteed to get to the other side. The application could wipe its hands of it. I don't have to worry it anymore. Good old layer five is gonna take care of it and make sure the information gets to the other side. That means if a robot has to come along and plug a USB key and hand deliver it, if we have to tie it to a carrier pigeon or whatever else we have to do, layer five is gonna kick in and make sure the data gets to the other side or it tells the application exactly why. Regrettably, that kind of code doesn't exist. Layer five is poorly implemented, but if it were, data would always arrive or we'd have a perfect reason why it didn't. Nevertheless, layer five is truly the borderline of where application really starts to turn into networking. Once we take the service data unit of layer five and pass it down to layer four, in this particular example, we're gonna talk TCP. So layer four is gonna say, oh, wait a minute, that's a really big file. The rest of the network can't handle a big monster like that. So if you watch the top left-hand corner of your screen, that file and all that overhead is going to turn into just a, a grid of segments. 
at layer four, when you break up those little pieces, we call that a segment. Each one of those segments peeled out one at a time. There it comes. We put the layer four overhead on top of that segment and pass it down to the next layer. Now, I'll talk more about it, those individual segments once we get to the layer four on the other side. Meanwhile, we have a segment to move. That segment comes into layer three, while at layer four, that fragment or that service data unit would be called a segment. At layer three, we call it a packet, and a packet is gonna have a source and destination IP address, where layer three is concerned with routing. Layer three is concerned with the entire internet as a whole, and the address that's applied here, called the IP address, is global in scope. It really doesn't have a whole lot of local permutations to it. It may, but the purpose of IP is global in scope. We're gonna find the right destination. Well, that packet is passed down to the next layer as a service data unit. This time the encapsulation is different. Look, there is both a header and a trailer. See those green parts? There is a header part. There's also a trailer part. This is because layer two has a very important responsibility that's distinctive from the other layers. Layer two has to detect errors, but not necessarily correct them, but it must detect errors. And that's what the trailer is all about. It's placed there as a mathematical value that once this information is received at the other end, that value can be used to test to see if this frame was damaged. And by the way, this particular protocol data unit is called a frame because it has both a header and a trailer and it's frame. So we heard of actually four very important protocol data units, the segment that's at layer four, the packet, which is layer three, and now the frame, which is at layer two. This frame is now converted to actual bits, physical bits on the wire, and if luck is with us, the bits arrive at the other end exactly the way we sent them. We send them out normally in a serial fashion and the information passed up again to layer two. Now that mechanism of the layer one to layer two, we're gonna actually cover in a subsequent video when we talk about ethernet itself. It's much easier to actually throw the microscope on that piece. So here we are at layer two now, but we're on the receiving end. We're no longer gonna go down the stack, we're going to go back up. Well, we just received an ethernet frame and the first thing we have to do is check the trailer and see, is this frame damaged? Because if it's damaged, it's gotta go. We're gonna throw it away. And we're not going to acknowledge the fact or we're not gonna knack it to say that uh, it didn't show up. We're just going to discard it. That's the way ethernet works. If doing math indicates that it was broken. That kind of ruins the story. So let's say that everything works out, it's fine. So we're gonna reach into that frame and yank the packet out of it and pass it up to layer three. Now at layer three, uh, pretty much the work involved here is to say, hey, this destination IP address, is that me? If the answer is yes, which in this case, we're telling the story that it is, then we actually just have to reference a port address. That's the address of the specific layer four that we need to contact. As a result, the packet is disassembled the segment is yanked out of it and passed up to the proper port at layer four. Now, layer four is smart enough to know it just received one segment. That's all. So if we, if we look at layer four right here, that H4 marks you know, that one little segment. Now the receiving end is smart enough to know that this isn't the end of the story. So the receiving end checks this off, and, and now what TCP would do would be to actually send a message back down the stack over to this, specifically talking to layer four. This is peer communications now between layer four. Basically saying, I have received message number one. I'm looking for message number two now. Well, let's say in our story, we're gonna send message two, message three, and message four. But in our story, let's pretend that message four never shows up, just as an example. So there goes message two. It gets checked off and an acknowledgement immediately goes back. Well, of course, message three, check. Message four, oh no, it dies. Well, obviously there's no check over here. We have a gaping hole. 
What happens next is kind of interesting, uh, depending on how well the TCP stack is written. But you have to understand, at this point, the transmit again has no idea that message number four perished. So it continues. I'm going to send message five, I'm going to send six, I'm going to seven. So the behavior is quite interesting, actually. On the receiving end, let's say that message five is received. If the stack is really well written, then message five will be checked in. And a message going back will say, I have received message three. I'm waiting for message four. And of course, then uh, message uh, six comes in. And guess what the response is that goes back? I have to receive message three. I'm waiting for number four. Can you catch a clue? And let's say that that message seven comes in, and maybe you guessed it, the response that goes back. I've received message three. I'm waiting for message four. And uh, eventually, layer four at this end says, you know what? I think you're waiting for message four. Let me send that one again. You obviously haven't received it. So uh, the, pack, the um, layer four transmits layer four. We get the big check mark right there saying, yay, I've received message four. Now let's count them up. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven have been received. So the message going back now would be say, I've received message seven. I'm waiting for message eight. And of course, then the process would continue like this until ultimately this entire block is filled up. So TCP can work very efficiently if we're trying to move a really big file and a few of those little packets are dropping out in between, TCP will handle those retransmits. But just be aware, there is a fairly lengthy turnaround time to get that missing packet four in again. If we're running a situation where we're trying to do things in real time, this behavior wouldn't really be desirable. Uh, better to use UDP or some other layer four behavior. Meanwhile, we, let's say we've received the entire file, everything's ready to go, TCP has put it together, then it's time for TCP to pass that information up to layer five. Layer five receives it, peels off its header, passes it up to layer six. Layer six presents the information as necessary, passes it up to the application. The application, which understands its header, peels the information off and delivers the file to the destination. And there you have it, OSI at its finest.